gospel today is, as usual, both simple and profound. And I will try to capture both of those uh, to the best of my ability. And I might start off by being slightly irreverent. So please don't quote me. <laughs> if you do, I'll deny it. <laughs> Jesuits taught me that. If you quote me, I'll deny it. <laughs> I love this gospel. I love the impetuous nature of Peter who comes out, you know, well, I can do this. It's almost the same spirit with which he's saying, oh no, you're not going to Jerusalem. Nothing's bad going to happen to you. No, I, I won't let that happen. Peter is always the first out there to say, I can do that. I can understand that. I'll protect this. I'll manage this. I'll control that. And then he falls flat on his face. <laughs> Spiritually, psychologically, he, he crumbles. And he needs to. See, that's part of the plan. That's part of the revelation of the gospel. It's simple, but it's also profound, which is that God's in charge and we're not. And even the upper hierarchy isn't God. And so we can be assured that this is a divinely revealed gospel. Because if human beings have written it, and this is perhaps the slightly irreverent part, you know, church historians or theologians or Vatican officials have written this story. Peter would have walked right out there and had a great old time with the Lord, and everything would have been grand. Good for Peter. And it would have been a media frenzy. Everyone would have captured it. Peter. It's the Peter Glorious. We can be assured of the fact that this is divinely revealed by the fact that Peter blowing it, Peter glancing away from the Lord and immediately sinking, that that reality wasn't censored out and the text rewritten which might have been the case that human beings alone been writing the story. The Lord invites something more than merely human on the part of Peter. But the Lord provides that more than human, which is himself. The divine, the uncreated energies that are transmitted through the theandric nature sacred humanity of the Lord, the spirit-bearing humanity of the Lord. It was that humanity, the Lord's face, the Lord's eyes, the Lord's heart, the Lord's arms, outstretched arms and hands that, that invited Peter. Okay, if you want, come. And all Peter needed to do was to allow himself to be captivated by that moment. And perhaps it did last for a moment. We do know that he did walk out there, at least knows what it was, 10 seconds, 60 seconds, one minute, that he was able to walk on the water with the Lord. But the clock was ticking because there was a wind blowing, there was a storm in the sea, and in a moment of human weakness, all too human, Peter, who is all of us, by the way, you and me, in those moments of our life, Peter, for some reason, turns away from that face, that spirit-bearing face. Those eyes, that heart, those arms, that hands outstretched for him. He, he glances instead in a split second. He says, oh my God, I'm off the water in the middle of a turbulent sea of the ocean. And instantly he sinks. That moment, in that split second, the spell of the spirit, I should say, is broken. And Peter's back just to being good old human Peter, which means he's sick sinking to the bottom, unless the Lord, who responding to his urgent plea, help me, save me, does in fact lift him up and help him back into the boat. Lessons learned. Don't take your eyes off of Jesus. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about us. It's not even about Peter. <clears throat> Sometimes we 
forget that. Enough said. Peter didn't forget that. The Lord wouldn't let him. Because every time he had that temptation to forget it, he again falls. And has to be reminded again and again that the Lord has a will. It is more than a human will. That will involves the journey to Jerusalem that Peter not only couldn't understand, but tried to obstruct. Get behind me, Satan, says the Lord. And the Lord has not only a will, but a strength that our merely human strength doesn't possess. It is beyond us. How do we have access to that will that leads to Jerusalem, which is not just to disaster and humiliation, but to a cross that leads to resurrection, to new life, the greatest triumph of all? through an apparent defeat and humiliation a triumph. How do we access that divine strength, more than merely human, that leads us to even be able to walk on water? How do we access that strength, that will, to become all that we are called to be by being more than just ourselves, through faith? That was the gentle rebuke of the Lord to Peter today. Will you have little faith? He lost the faith when he turned away, and even just a split second from the Lord. And then he goes back to just Peter, Peter's strength, Peter's will, Peter's agenda. Under, order, or, under ordinary circumstances, maybe that could get you for a while, but in the middle of a storm at sea, the sink just like that. Peter, and you and me, the whole church, sinking. Glance away, even for an instant. And so, thank God this story wasn't written by Vatican censors <laughs> or theologians or church historians who would have given us another story and we would have missed the whole point. The whole point is the Lord Jesus Christ in the power of His Spirit. And outside of Him and that Spirit, there is no church, there is no Peter, there's just a big mess self-manufactured. And we're meant to learn the lesson of Peter today, not despite we're sometimes precisely in and through the moments when we sink, the moments when we fail, the moments when we don't quite get it, the moments when we fall short of the will and the strength of God. It's in those moments that he, far from rebuking us, just gently reminds us, gently but clearly, Through our trust and confidence in Him, through our love for Him alone. 